through false questions if you haven't done them yet. Okay. Um, now there's a good yeah. chance you may have already done them. Um, that's cool if you had. Hi, Ahmed. How are you? Hello, Professor. All right. And good, good, good. Love to hear it. And then Judy Lynn, how are you? Not bad. Not bad. I know it's <laughs> early for you. So yeah, and um, it's Thanksgiving to hear. Yes, yes, that's true. And then of course it's Columbus Day in America. So uh um, oh. yeah, so banks are closed, uh post office is closed, but my kid has school because some schools they celebrate it some don't it, it's up to the choice of the schools um it's one of those holidays where you know there's eight that everything closes but there's the the couple that they use as kind of floating holidays so very in interesting as to how how that happens but i don't know if you were you were catching what i was saying with neuron i'm going to go ahead and cover three chapters today uh, Ahmed, you okay. should appreciate my goal is not to read everything uh, <laughs> that we discussed last week, but <laughs> I'm going to try to focus on the slides a little bit more today versus that all of that language, like you said. Um, Narana, I did up, upload yesterday per your request the uh, notes uh, from the last couple or last week's session, but also for chapter two. So you should see those uploaded if that'll help you. Um, yes. I, okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. Does anybody have any questions on uh, the week one written assignment and the true false quiz? I'm trying to make it where it it's uh, not too much of your time, but it's still going to challenge you a little bit, if that makes sense. Does anybody have any questions on the written assignment? Yes. Sir. I have a question. I didn't start. Oh, okay, go ahead, Nora. <laughs> We all have questions. Uh oh. Okay. What's going on? Uh, my question was regarding the ABA. Um, I, I I think um, I, at the first place I didn't recognize from the first shot. Then uh, I uh, thought that it uh, is a style for referencing uh, uh, upon the 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 written paper. So if I uh, excluding a text from somewhere, so I have to write the reference in the ABA format, right? Correct. That is correct. Yes. OK. OK. Now, what I have done for you is in the announcements, because I run into this with uh, another school uh, that I teach for, because APA may not be common to you as far as a, a writing tool. Um, I did try to provide some guidance there. Now, here's what I'm going to do. If you're attempting it, you're doing your best, I'm, I'm going to go and, and work with it, OK? Just a FYI, OK? Um, I, I told you guys before, especially if it's something that you've never used as a tool, I will definitely work with you, OK, and, and grade accordingly and provide some feedback for the next time, OK? So first assignment. I'm going to be lenient, OK, uh, and I'll definitely work with you on that. So thank you for that question. I did think it was going to come up, which is why I wanted to put that announcement in the course. If you I haven't seen anybody submit their work yet, so if you want to go back in, of course, and edit your work, that's completely fine. OK, um, so I'm happy to do that. Uh, Ahmed, you had a question. Yeah, actually, um, I didn't start it yet. OK, but definitely I will be in contact with you. Uh, at least uh, privately for for uh, guidance and support. OK, no worries. I'm happy to do that. And again, you guys have my WhatsApp. Um, obviously, duh, because that's what we use. Um, you have my phone number, so you could definitely WhatsApp me in private if you'd feel more comfortable that way. No problem. I'm happy to help you. Um, and then Judy Lynn, you had a question as well. Uh, Noran already has. So that's the same with Noran. OK, cool. Yeah, okay. Thank you. You're very mm -hmm. welcome. And like I said, when it comes to APA, the Purdue OWL 
is really one of the go-tos other than having the reference manual itself. And I'll be honest with you, even when I was doing my writing back in the day, um, uh, even with my, my PhD work, um, I of course had to rely on tools because I'm not, I'm not a master when it comes to APA. And that's not what I'm asking you guys. I just want to make sure that, um, you know, when you're using outside resources, you're giving credit to the author, uh, whether it be an article, video, um, you know, the textbook even, right? If you're pulling a, a comment from there, just making sure that you're giving them the credit for the work that they uh, took the time to, to create. Uh, Naran, it looks like you were going to ask a question. Uh, yes, my question was, um, if um, if I used my own mind, I didn't use references or anything. So, uh, you, you, professor, will check from that. Or um, if I didn't provide uh, any references, you will think that I didn't provide the references. That was that would question. be my yeah. That would be my my thinking. Which again, I have students who will submit uh, work that would not have references. But as you know. Um, based on the, the point value, and I, I went pretty easy if you think about it. If you guys look at the rubrics, the point values, if somebody didn't use a reference, you're, you're losing what? You're losing, you know, point-wise, you're not losing as many as long as you don't lose any other points. But I really want you guys to get into that, especially if you decide to continue on after your, your MBA and you get into, let's say, even a PhD where you're going to have to use those resources to support you. And I'm going to be honest with you, and this is going to sound bad, but when I went through my master's program, I didn't have to do any writing or support my work using the APA. And to be honest with you, when I went to work on the advanced degree, it really impacted me negatively because I was behind compared to others because there was that learning curve for me, okay? But again, I'll be very lenient on how I grade you uh, on that if you want to do your best and attempt it, okay? Um, I would suggest that, okay? Um, now, others, I do apologize. Let me do this, guys. Let me put my, I'm sorry. Let me put my headphones in. Are you guys able to hear me? No? Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Can yes, hear professor. you. No, we cannot. No sounds. We cannot hear you. We still cannot hear you. Can't hear you. Uh oh, no sound. Now we hear you. Oh, now you do because okay, I took them out. All right, cool. My apologies. Okay. Um, the uh, I think you can you can you still use them, but you have to modify the settings. I do, I do, and I just didn't do that prior to. Um, I'm so used to Google Meet, Ahmed, where it automatically does it for me, and that's that's on my end. Um, all right, so question for, does anybody else uh, have any questions about assignment one or the true false questions? No? Okay. So I let's will, get into I will today. Add for the additional, for the, What's written, that? for the written assignment, can I add, can I ask more again question? Of course. Yes, that's what this yeah. is for. I want to answer it, any questions I can. Is the 250 or 500 words counted the uh, counted the uh, the credit that we have for from other authors or from other resources? I'm not sure. If, uh, yeah, yeah. So if you use, absolutely, I I will do that for you. Uh, and I appreciate you asking that question. 
at first it caught me off guard, but absolutely, I wouldn't take off for that. Okay. Um, as far as that 250 to 500 words. So yeah. if you utilize that in there, that if you think about it, that adds up to that 500. If you go over a little bit, cool. I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to, uh, you know, take off points if you're over or you're under a little bit. Yeah. My big thing is I don't want, and again, I often tell my students this, I'll get students that will write me maybe one paragraph to respond to something. And I want you to dive into it a little, give me some depth, give me something that where you are teaching me, right? That's what I want. We learn best from each other. So if you're answering that question, you're helping me learn that you understood what the question was asking and you were able to go. So a one paragraph response Eh, okay, it, 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 it's okay, but it's not going to give me the depth that I'm looking for from you, okay? But again, these point values that I've given you, you have plenty of time throughout the term, the way I do the grading, to give yourself the ability to get the, uh, the overall grade that you need for this particular course, right? And I know there are going to be some of you that maybe want that that A, the biggest thing for me is that you learn the material and that you make it through the course and you get the grade that you need. Um, of course, I'd love everybody to get an A. That's the way it goes. That's the way I work. But if you don't, as long as you're understanding learning and you get through the course, that's the biggest key. Okay. Great question, Judy Lynn. Uh, anybody else have any questions? No? Okay. Okay. So let's get started. As I mentioned to those of you that are, for those of you who joined late, I'm going to go through three chapters today. I know that's a lot, but I'm going to hit the chapters because as I was going through the material a little bit more in depth, chapter two and three have some of those carryover components to them. And so it's very important not for me to just skip ahead and start with chapter three and four, like I showed you uh, that we were covering this week. So what we're going to do in covering chapter one is we're going to we're going to discuss what determines interest rates. OK, so what is all the determinants? Now, when we talk about that, we're going to be examining uh the components of what we call the nominal interest rate. Now, what is the nominal interest rate? It's the interest rate that is generated before taking inflation into account, which is different from the real interest rates and effective interest rates. Okay. Now, what do the nominal interest rates affect? They directly affect the value quote unquote, the price of most securities traded in the money and the capital markets. Those changes in the rates influence performance and decisions that investors, businesses, and government units make, right? So let us quickly, let me ask you quickly a question. How in your country or in your location in the world, how have interest rates impacted you? Since what we're talking about today is interest rates. Can you share how they in impact maybe you as an individual, but your country as a whole? Who would like to share first? Please, can you repeat the question, sir? Absolutely. So in your country, Naran, we're talking about interest rates at the beginning here, right? Well, let's let's talk simplified right now. How overall have interest rates in your country affected the economy, both maybe for you and also for the businesses that you know of in your particular country? Can anybody does anybody want to share? And of course, uh, yeah, go ahead. I can share an idea. Okay. Actually, when the bank's interest rate increase, um, 
this mean um, that the people will take all its money savings to put in the bank because that will guarantee for them uh, a good percent of uh, interest this uh, monthly that uh, they could uh, uh, share in their monthly expenses. Correct. And uh, I think in the in some countries when they encourage people to to make some investments with their money or open uh, uh, small um, small companies and being entrepreneurs so they make the interest rates uh, with negative so they can encourage people to use their money in the market and uh, invest uh, in uh, live projects like startups for example i think this is in japan or in a country in asia i i i have heard this info so uh, the economy of the country depends on the interest rate and what the government needs to, the, the citizens to do. They increase depend on the interest rate or decrease it. That's correct. Very good. And we're actually, Neuron, you're right on point. And um, if you have read ahead, awesome. If not, we are going to um, be looking at that. That's one thing that we will take a look at here in, in just a little bit. Um, okay, so Ahmed uh, Ibrahim, you're saying it ranges between 13% and 14% in your bank, which is considered relatively high to other countries. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that's a pretty high interest rate, right? And that is something that the banks will take into consideration. Now, if it that interest rate's that high, we're talking now, let's talk expenses, right? W would you go and borrow a loan against that type of uh, interest rate? What do you think, Judy Lynn? In in Canada, I don't know what the the interest rates are, but if you were you were going to a bank to try to get money and a loan in a thirteen to fourteen percent rate, are you inclined to do that? What's that going to do to you for you? Oh, uh, no, I don't. That's 30 and 40 percent is so much. Right. Yeah. In, yeah. It, but in here in Canada, uh, uh, the interest rate is depend on the inflation. is how the market goes mm -hmm. because they based on how the people, how the minimum wages of the people and how it goes in the market. So that's how they will follow. They cannot mm -hmm. easily go. I'll go it to 30 percent. They can't do that because we have regulation, right? Yes. Yes. Now, and so something we're experiencing in the U.S. is one, we're going through a period of inflation. And the government has, which we'll talk about the feds in a little bit, they've increased the interest rate. And so what is that going to do to the economy? We're already in inflation, so people have less money to spend. You're raising the interest rates. What do you think that's going to do? Are people going to be borrowing against that? Um, and and let's use mortgages as an example. Uh, again, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, which I'm trying to do that to bridge this gap in learning. We have seen such small supply and housing market in the U.S. based on where interest rates have been that the the demand is so high. People are are paying well above the rates for housing. There are people that are going into bidding wars. Houses are staying on the market less than a day. But with this most recent interest rate hike, we're already starting to see the trickle effect on it. And now less there's there's going to be more supply here very soon in the housing market because people are going to be like urge now i can't i can't i can't take out a loan for that type of interest rate now we are much better than where we were in the early 80s because we were seeing 14 and 15 percent interest rates on a mortgage that is extremely extremely high but also the houses were a lot cheaper then than compared to today i.e inflation and how it affects everything Okay, so this is just a quick graph. This illustrates the movement. It's very hard to see. 
Um, so I will send this to you. The difference between 1972 up to 2019, and it talks about the movement in the U.S. interest rates over the past 47 years. So the federal rates used, these were what were used in interbank borrowing. Okay, so you can see the fluctuation in the interest rates. And obviously, based on that, would tell you why and where we're going to see uh, increases and decreases in spending. Now, let's talk about loadable funds. So the Federal Reserve, back in the day, pushed short-term interest rates to near record lows to, in order to stimulate the economy. We're going back to um, thinking about the what we talked about last week when we talked about that recession that we went through and the financial crisis back in 08, 09. So in order to that, they pursued the policy of quantitative easing, or easing, excuse me, okay, which they purchased government and mortgage debt. They created money in addition to uh, an additional attempt to encourage spending and investment. Now, according to this, interest rate is now determined by the demand for and the supply of loanable funds. The term loanable funds includes all forms of credit, which is loans, bonds, and savings deposits. Okay. So now in mid 2013, the Fed as we're going to call them, the Federal Reserve, announced it would begin gradually tapering its bond purchases, although the interest rates continue to be reinvested in the long-term securities. So December 2015, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates, but did not do so again until 2016 of December. Now, we since then have not really seen an increase in the interest rates, which we just, again, they just did it for the first time in, in some period. So in 2017, the Fed raised the interest rates slightly. And then 2017, they raised the target federal fund rate between 1% and 1.25%. And that indicated it may raise the funds a rate a total of three times in 2017. Now, here's an example. We are extending to do this, extending beyond the low rates set by the Federal Reserve during the financial crisis. Banks such as the Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank, and several smaller Union Central Banks utilized an unconventional policy of setting negative interest rates. Naran, I believe that's what you were alluding to a moment ago, correct? Yes, sir. Exactly. So when those central banks set negative rates, the lender actually pays the borrower instead of getting paid for depositing funds with the bank. Negative interest rate is an extreme strategy, okay, of reducing borrowing costs to encourage consumption and investment. So again, we're trying to get stimulation in the market because we want money being spent. Without money being spent, we don't go anywhere. We don't grow. Businesses die. We have less choice, right? Again, I talked about that cyclical effect. And that's what we're trying to do with the interest rates. We're utilizing that not only to get people to invest in the bank to earn more money on the money they've put in, but to help those companies to stay afloat, right? An example is in the U.S., the car manufacturers. The government in the U.S. was trying to bail out these automotive manufacturers because they are a big part of our economy. They are. We don't keep cars very long. We we like to spend money on our cars because it's a it, it's kind of that. Uh, I don't know if you guys know the term keeping up with the Joneses, which means that people always want the 
the new, right? And again, what's one way you can show that you have the new, the wealth, and, and you have money is automotive. So again, the government to stimulate that tried to put money and give them loans with these low interest rates involved. Any questions on that? Okay, so the supply of loanable funds. The supply of loanable funds, it represents the behavior of, behavior of all of the saver, savers in the economy. The higher the interest rate that a saver can earn, the more likely they are to save money. As such, the supply of loanable funds shows that the quantity of savings available will increase as interest rates increase. Now let's take a step back real quick. And what? who is a saver, okay? A saver is the party who preserves the money to be invested, okay? For a narrower definition, this term refers to those who place money in the bank, okay? That could be you, that could be the company, and it can also be the government, okay? That's the saver. So for example, if you put money in a time deposit, you are a saver, okay? So really when I say saver, as we're talking about things, it could be looking at different individuals, okay? It doesn't just mean you or me. It could be looking at the company and the government. Um, Naran, you shared a little earlier, so I'd like somebody else um, to answer this. In your country, can you give me a time where you found the rates were too good to be true and you had to get your money into the bank, into the market somewhere to get you such a great return? Can you guys give me an example of a time that, that you saw that and experienced it? For my country now. We have very high interest rates currently with the, with the rise of dollar volume from the Egyptian pound. So uh, there is a very uh, high values. Okay. And I remember you mentioned that last week, right, compared to the dollar. So yes. that, that's, that's great. So see how that all, all plays a part. And obviously, as we know, the negative occurs too, right? So we'll see if, as that goes down, the less likely we are to invest. Is anybody experiencing in their country a decrease in the value of the interest rate? So you're seeing less people put in or people actually pulling out. Can anybody share in their country if they're seeing the opposite? Well, I uh, in Kuwait, um, I have seen a number of people going to invest in gold, in buying gold. Okay. But not to use it in the bank. Hmm. Although yes. I am Egyptian, so I am from Egypt. Okay. And at the time uh, the inflation started, uh, it was 1 KD equals to 60 pounds. Hmm. I think that was uh, a year or two ago. And people mm -hmm. here actually started to take loans to convert the Kuwaiti dinar to Egyptian pounds. Wow. So can you imagine like, like yeah. uh, because you, simply you are talking 100 KD equals 6,000 uh, pounds. Mm -hmm. So if someone is taking, let's say 10,000 KD, they will take a loan from the bank here mm -hmm. with a certain interest. Okay, but to so they they will convert the money, the dinars, to Egyptian pounds and put it in the bank in Egypt in Egypt to get a higher rate. Interesting. So they will they will put themselves uh, under pressure of paying loan with interest. Okay, uh, minimizing their uh, expenses, uh, putting themselves and their families. Uh, in I can say tight tight situation, mm -hmm. okay, maybe for year two or up to five years because loans here are uh, the payment is up to five years. Then 
they they are expecting like a good outcome from their deposits in Egypt banks. Right. Right. And as we know, Ahmed, one one situation could ultimately change all of that, which puts them into a now a negative situation. So it is risky what you're saying. It again, is risky. Very risky. And that's again what happened to us in the US when it came to the housing market. Um, I'm going to give you a personal example. In 2004, 2005, I was living in Las Vegas, Nevada. Rates were so good, prices were so good that people were buying three and four homes, selling two of those homes at either a profit or of course, you know, well, that's exactly what they were trying to do. They were trying to sell them. So they were buying them, turning around, flipping them, and selling them, right? They weren't even flipping them when I mean by doing, fixing things up. They were just keeping them and saying, oh, shoot, I'm going to keep them a month or two, sell them, and I'm going to make some money. Well, guess what? We had a bubble burst. And those values of those homes plummeted. And what happened? People took that risk. And eventually what they did was they now had to end up filing for what we would call in the U.S. bankruptcy because they could no longer afford those mortgages and they could no longer well, afford <coughs> to keep those. This, I think this applies to the uh, late comers, like the, the fresh comers when the opportunity happens. OK, those are the people who actually, you know, uh, gained a lot. Yes. Yes. But if someone going to start late, like they have seen uh, everything happening around them, some people got crazy rich and they are trying again. So they thinking, yeah, let's do the same. Those are the late ones. So mm -hmm. it might work. It might not work. And again, actually, absolutely, Ahmed. And and again. You gave a good example with those loans and and uh, converting that because it could easily mm -hmm. happen, easily happen. And so, you know, where I was going with the original uh, example, I was going to pay two hundred and sixty two thousand dollars for what was not a very big house in Las Vegas. And not even a year later, fortunately, I didn't do it. When that bubble burst, that house had a value of $100,000. So I ended up moving from Nevada to Tennessee. Had I had that home, I would have lost my behind. Right. So that's something. And, and this all goes back to the interest rates and, and different things. So I apologize if it feels like I got off tangent a little bit, but this is very important to what we're talking about now. All right. And so, again, as we know, it's just a typical. The demand is high with the interest rate and supply is low. It's a it's a it's really a cyclical effect there. Now let's talk about demand for loanable funds. Demand for loanable funds is the total net demand for funds by the users, you or me, let's say. In general, the quantity of those loanable funds demanded is higher as interest rates fall. Again, all of this is nothing new if we put it into a basic concept. Household demand reflects financing purchases of homes, durable goods, and non-durable goods. Now, and this was back $16.05 in 2019. Businesses demand funds to finance their investments in long-term assets and for short-term short working capital needs. So, uh, and governments will also borrow heavily, right? We do that from each other. The U.S. has borrowed money from China. It, it, it's all involved together. Foreign participants mostly use the business sector, mostly from the business sector, borrow in our market, in the finan U.S. financial market. So. Again, if foreign participants, let's go back to the example I made, you kind of shared a moment ago, 
But let's say that a foreign participants who mostly, again, from business, are now borrowing in the U.S. financial market. We've started to see a recession. What do you think is happening right now to the, the monies that they're now investing in the U.S. market? Anybody? Can you repeat the last sentence again, please? Yes. Uh, yes, I am happy to. So if we're looking at those businesses that borrow in the U.S. financial market, we now have hit a quote unquote recession. What do you think has gone to the value of the money that they have borrowed from the U.S.? What's that done for them? Anybody? Became less value. Exactly. Yeah. Simple as that. Less value for them. So they're now not making the the mo the monies that they were expecting to make, right? But it goes back to your exact example of they could have invested in uh, taking the loan in in like you said in Egypt and going into a different market to try to get more money on return. Okay. Or a better rate. Okay. Um, now, what are some factors that cause the supply and demand curves? Okay. So let's talk about supply and demand curves. What factors affect it? Wealth of the fund suppliers. So the persons that are funding, right? Increases or decreases the supply of the loanable funds, increases and decreases. So if I'm a investor, okay, obviously I am the one that is, let's say, going to put in five hundred dollars into your business. Well, if my interest rates that on the monies I've borrowed are higher, that means I've got less money to put in. Am I gonna be able to give you $500? No, okay. But if my rates are great, my revenues are great, am I gonna be able to give you that money? Absolutely, maybe I can give you more, okay. Now, as risk of financial security increases, the supply, of the loanable funds decreases. Again, it's exactly what I was just saying. Okay. As near term spending needs increase, okay, as near term spending needs increase, the supply of loanable funds increases. Okay. Monetary policy objectives allow the economy to expand and the supply of loanable funds increase, all right? So I know this is all a lot. Ahmed, we talked about this last week. The terminology can be a lot that we're talking about here. And we'll go through some examples in just a second. Um, and as a, economic conditions improve in a domestic country, the supply of the funds increase. Let's put it into simple terms. If my rates are low, again, it all comes back to exactly where we started this. If my rates are low, what I'm paying, I've got more money coming in, I can give more. If I'm not making money, I'm an investor, I can't give more. So it all, again, plays based on those interest rates. Does that does that make sense or do I need to clarify a little bit more? It makes sense. It's uh, it's the it's the market uh, as we started before yeah. is going to the equilibrium point. Absolutely. There it is. Very, right? That's exactly what it is. You know, I think it's very funny, Ahmed, as we as we continue to talk about this and 
you know, we start getting in all the, I'm going to use the term jargon. We, we have a tendency when it comes to this to make it harder because there are factors that get become involved, which again, we'll, we'll go over here shortly. But in, in, in essence, it can be very simple, right? All right. It can be very simple. But if anybody needs me to clarify, uh, I'm happy to do that as we're going through this, okay? All right. So let's move on because, again, I want to make sure I'm keeping up on our time today because of how much I'm trying to cover. Okay. So factors that cause supply and demand curves to funds to, and the loanable funds to shift. What happens? Okay. As utilities derived from an asset purchased with borrowed funds increases, the demand for loanable funds increases. Okay. All right. So I'm going to use the car market as an example. All right. The government gave the car manufacturers the additional they bailed them out they gave them the ability to borrow additional funds right so there's been an increase in the amount of funds they can borrow now what does that give that ability it increases their funds which gives them the ability to now do what purchase more of the parts that they need to build their cars right so that's giving them that ability. Now, as the restrictiveness of non-price conditions on borrowed funds decreases, the demand for loanable funds also increases. Okay? So, again, what is restriction? What's the definition of restriction? Somebody give me that definition. Anybody? What is the definition of restriction or what is the meaning of that term to restrict? What was that, Ahmed? Put boundary, uh, boundaries. To put Correct. boundaries. To put boundaries on, right? Now, so what does that mean? All we're saying here is if we are easing the boundaries right on those funds the ability to get them our demand is going to go up so if again if i could buy a house let's say for and put no money down right where it used to be that i had to put down at least three and a half percent of the price of that home. Okay. Well, is, am I going to be, would I go purchase a home if I could get the loan for it? Absolutely. Because now we've said, Hey, I'm lifting that restriction on you. You now can go buy this home with no money down. That's what we're talking about here. Right. OK, now, when domestic economic conditions result in a period of growth. The demand for the funds in increase. OK, so again. Several years ago, our economy was doing great in the US. People were buying, you know, again, gas prices were down, food prices were down. So people had more money. So they said, well, I can't necessarily pay for that outright, but I can go borrow funds because I can afford that monthly payment. Interest rates are good. I've got more money in my pocket. Boom. Right. Have you all ever experienced that? Have you done something like that? That. You know, you felt like, OK, I've got the extra money's money's available. The economy is going really well. I'm not worried about interest rates going up at the moment. 
So I'm going to go do it and buy something. What is something that, let's pick something small. You've got the extra money in your pocket. Not enough to buy something outright. Okay. So what is something that you've ever gone and gotten a loan for? Because again, rates were just too good to be true. And it was a good economy. Can somebody share an example of something they've, they've purchased that was all because of those factors being aligned? Anyone? Uh, I will purchase some stocks or shares. You can purchase some stocks and shares. Now there's risk there, but I'm talking about loanable funds right now in the sense of, let's oh, say, okay. a bank loan. Say a bank loan, right? Have you ever wanted to buy? Okay, let's, um, it's, a, it's Let's use a car as an example. Again, I've got the extra money available, right? Uh, interest rates are at a great, great rate. I've been wanting a new car. Do you think if I've got the money available that I'm going to go borrow and, and maybe go get that car even though I don't need it? Am I more willing to do that? Naran, would you be willing to do it if you had that availability? Or if you had that ability? Excuse me. Um, actually, I don't fully understand the situation, so okay. it's totally good for more clarification. Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, where I'm going with that? So right now, let's say, again, economic conditions where you are, are great, right? You're in a period of growth. You have uh, extra money put aside or you can work with. Would you potentially go buy that car you've been wanting for a while if, if things are really, really good in the market? Or is there something you'd be willing to go borrow money to buy? that if the market wasn't good, you wouldn't do? Uh, if the situation is good, of course, and I have a uh, saving money. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, I will go to buy this car. Okay. But uh, if the situation is not good, so, uh, and I have the saving money, so I will not go, go to this car. And I will not, of course, borrow to buy it. So I will prefer to save the money for the basics, life basics. That's true. That's exactly right. And that's what I'm saying. The market that we're, we're playing in, all of it, again, is something we have to consider. Now, again, we're seeing that in the U.S. Now we have individuals who, for the last couple of years, they were spending money, borrowing money. They were we're borrowing, 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 and things were good. And guess what? Prices have now increased. Gas has increased. Electric bill, food. Now that extra money they had that they took the risk on to buy that new car. You ever heard of buyer's remorse? Now they're experiencing that. So, Naran, you're right. If you have that ability and thought to not go and borrow that, you're thinking ahead to say, okay, there could be bad times ahead i'll just hang on to what i have and keep that saving right i think ahmed what's that go back to the risk we keep talking about right so there's all a financial risk in it so companies governments us we all experience the same thing now it is all related to those interest rates because again we keep talking about inflation right now it's the continual increase in the price and level of a basket of goods the higher the level of the actual or expected inflation, the higher will be the level of interest rates. Again, I mentioned earlier, in the US, interest rates increase, have recently increased. Part of that is because of inflation. They want people to put their money into the savings because they're going to get a higher rate, but they also want people to 
borrow while they're at a higher interest rate. So that's more money being put back into the banks, the government, the companies. Okay. I'm not going to go into all of the calculations and things like that. Um, we're just going to look at it from the qualitative perspectives uh, here. Now, what is a determinant of interest rates for individual securities? What are the real risk free rates? A real risk free rate is the interest rate that would exist on a risk free security if no inflation were expected over the holding period. Okay, so I'll give an example here in a second. The higher the society's preference to consume today, the higher the real, excuse me, risk-free rate. Now, every investment carries some level of risk, however small. So a risk-free rate is something of a, what we call a theoretical concept, okay? Um, I'm going to use student loans in the U.S. That's a big topic as an example, okay? It used to be that the interest rate to pay back on those federal student loans, which again, we all need or all feel we need an education to improve, i.e. while you're here, okay? So when I was in school, I was borrowing because the federal student loan rate that I was borrowing against was 3%. To me, that was my real risk-free rate. However, the term risk is what we're looking at here. My student loan rates now are 6%. Okay? Now, if somebody was borrowing minimal amounts to go to school, 6% still sounds like a pretty good rate. But when you start to get in the amount of loans that I owe for my uh, education, 6% is a high rate. I did not expect at the time that my loan payback rate of 3% was going to go to 6%. Now, what's that matter? What matters is the fact that now, because we all thought, I'm going to say many Americans, thought that we would not see that type of increase. We are seeing more individuals defaulting on student loans because they can't afford the payments because of the interest involved and the amount of money they're earning against those interest rates. So again, there's a risk, you know, that's involved here. Okay. Now, Again, that's what they consider a theory at this point. What's a default risk? A default risk is the risk that a security issuer will fail to make it prom its promised interest rate and principal payments to the buyer of a security. Again, me as the loan borrower, there's a risk that the federal government that gave me that money that i may not be able to pay that back okay and again i may not be able to pay that interest back okay so the higher the default risk the higher the interest rate that will be demanded by the buyer of the security to compensate him or her for this default. What do I mean there? What I mean is this. 
if I am a business that loans money to someone and I say, okay, my normal rate of interest is, again, let's say 3%. And I know that about 30% of the people that borrow money from me are going to default and not pay back that interest. What am I going to do? Based on what we just covered there. What would you do as a business? Okay. Again, hear me out. You're going to bought, let borrow. Uh, let's say you're going to let a family member borrow a thousand dollars. Right. And you say, I'm going to let you borrow $1,000 from me, but I want 3% on top returned to me. Okay, so picture that. You know that unfortunately, that family member cannot necessarily be trusted to pay you back that 3% interest, right? So what are you doing? You're going to say, okay, in my mind, here's what I'm going to do. Because I know I may not see that full 3% from that individual, I'll charge them 6%. So now you say to them, okay, for my $1,000 that I'm letting you borrow, I want 6% interest. Why are you doing that? Because you know there's a chance that you will not get all of that 6%. So you're going to get some of that money versus all 6%. Does that make sense? Can anybody share an example of their thought of what I'm it's like? I'm, yeah, it's like aiming for the stars. So you will land up on the moon. There you go. You're getting something, right? But, oh, man. but in my in my family, you will not get even the one thousand dollars. <laughs> I would say, Ahmed, that would be my way to that would be my family too. I agree. I agree. But I wanted to use that as an example because that's what the, the businesses are gonna do. The bank's gonna loan you that money, knowing that if 10 people borrowed that money, 20%. Well, maybe 10% of them, right? So what that one person out of 10 is not going to pay them all of that interest back plus their money. So what they do, they throw a little bit of extra interest on top of it. And by the way, car dealerships are really bad at that. They will throw extra money on top because they know there's a good chance that even though you're borrowing that loan, uh, from the bank. They want the bank to make their money back on. It. So they they do a little bit of F&I in there, finance and insurance, to protect themselves. Happens all the time. It, it's a it's a cyclical thing. Ahmed, were you going to say something? No, no. Oh, okay. I just pressed by mistake. That's okay. All right. Okay. What is liquidity risk? Liquidity risk is the risk that a security can be sold at a predictable price with a low transaction cost on short notice. So a highly liquid asset is one that can be sold at a predictable price with a low transaction cost and can be converted into the full market value okay if a security is if is e-liquid investors add a liquidity risk premium to the interest rate on the security that reflects its relative liquidity don't know why that word gives me a hard time sometimes but it does um lrp which is the liquid risk premium might also be thought of as a illiquidity premium. Now, what does that 
liquidity risk premium may also exist if the investor dislikes the long-term securities because their prices are more sensitive to interest rate changes than short-term security. Okay. Again, think of, and I, I go often because it's what I know, think of a car loan. Are you as a bank going to work or be willing to work more with that individual buying a two to three year car loan, borrowing money against two to three year payback? Or are you going to be more apt to give them that five year loan when there could be things like, let's say they have a variable rate on that loan and there could be interest rate changes. Would you rather get that short-term money or take that risk of getting the long-term money? Does that make sense? That's when we're talking about liquidity. When something is being borrowed and there is a chance that the rates might change, would I rather give them the short term, again, two to three year loan or five year, where I know I'm gonna get some money here versus I don't know here. Does that make sense? Anybody? I think Ahmed, Ju Judy, Lynn, you repeat again, please? would speak up. <laughs> Can you repeat again, please? Yes. So again, Ahmed, if I was going to give you a loan, okay, I'm a lender. I'm going to give you a loan, but there's a variable interest rate involved, okay? Meaning that what? That interest rate could fluctuate short-term and long-term, more long-term than short-term, right? I'm giving you a loan, and you said, Dr. Terry, I want to I want to borrow a loan from you but I want to pay it back in 2 years. Okay? Okay. Or Judy Lynn says, "Dr. Terry, I want to borrow a loan from you, but again, same variable interest rate between the two of you potentially, right? But I want to pay you back in 5 years, Dr. Terry." Who am I going to have the best chances of getting my money from if it's liquid? If we're talking about variable rates, you've borrowed and said I'm paying back in two years. Judy Lynn has borrowed and said she's paying me back in five years. Where do I think I'm going to? Oh, yes, safe. Uh, wouldn't the two years be? you'll have a higher chance of getting your money back because it's Absolutely. a sort of time frame. Uh, less can go wrong. A lot can a lot can happen in five years where a person is unable to pay back, right? That's correct. You're spot on there. That's exactly where I was going with that. That's that liquidity you gotta you gotta think about. It, again, it goes back to the fact of is it better to get something versus nothing, right? Because when inflation occurs, we we have um, less money to spend. Again, I'm I'm a homeowner here. I've got less money because I'm paying out more money for groceries, more money for gas, etc. I have to determine: Do I pay the light bill, or do I pay a loan to the bank? Which one would you pay? Light bill or loan? You have those two choices. Which one would you pay? Light bill, of course. Exactly. That's what we're kind of talking about here. Okay. And that's the risk. That bank, that security, they have to think about that. Okay. Yeah. That's exactly what they have to think about. All right. Now, let's talk about special provisions or covenants. 
Special provisions or covenants that may be written into a contract are there to underlie security, also affect the interest rates on those different securities, on those monies. Okay. Some of those provisions include the securities taxability, convertibility, and calliability. Okay. So for an investor, the interest rates on municipal securities are free of federal, state, and local taxes. Meaning, again, I'm investing here because I am not going to be taxed. Okay. A convertible or a special feature of a security offers the holder the opportunity to exchange one security for another type of issuer security at a present price. Okay. Um, so that's saying in the contract, I can give. I can exchange this at some point or another. In general, special provisions that provide benefits to the security holder, a tax-free status or convertibility are associated with lower rates. Okay. So I'm not going to go into that again. I want to get moved on. But I want you to read up on that one because I want to get again to we've got chapter three and four still. I'm looking at our time here. OK. The term structure of interest rates is a comparison of market yields on securities, assuming all characteristics except except maturity are the same. So a change in required interest rates as the maturity of a security changes is called the premium. It can be positive, negative, or zero. Or zero. I'm thinking about cereal. Sorry about that, guys. I'm hungry. Um, so if it's positive, negative, or zero, excuse me, it's depicting that relationship between that bond, okay? Again, so that's what we're talking about with the term of the, the term structure of those rates. It's a comparison of those yields, the potential, right? This is the common shape of uh, for a yield curve on a treasury security. Okay, interest rate down, time to mature goes up. Okay. Interest rate down again, time to maturity goes up. Interest rates fluctuate. They're high, they go down. Maturity takes less time, but as you can see, if the interest rate goes up, it takes additional time to mature. Okay. We talked about the stock market last week. And, you know, when you think about that, this is this is the type of curve you can expect right here as your money is sitting in there that you're investing in. because again rates go up and down so the time that your loans your monies that are sitting in there for those banks to mature it fluctuates The relationship between a security's interest rate and its remaining term to maturity, again, the term structure of the rate can take a number of different shapes. Explanations for the shape of the yield curve fall predominantly into three theories. Unbiased, so there's a, just a general view, there's no biases taken into consideration. Liquidity, which we've already discussed, and the market segmentation, i.e., what market is it in, which affects that. Okay. So, what is the definition here, real quick? For an unbiased expectation theory, at any given point in time, the yield curve reflects the market's current expectations. Okay. Uh, according to unbiased expectation, the return for a holding on a four-year bond to maturity 
should equal the expected return for investing in four successive one-year bonds, as long as the market is in equilibrium, okay? Liquidity. Long-term rates are equal to geometric averages of current and expected short-term rates. So investors will hold the long-term maturity only when they are offered at a premium to compensate for the future uncertainty of that security's value. And the liquidity premium increases as maturity increases. And then again, the market segmentation looks at the interest rates that are determined by distinct the supply and demand conditions. Okay. I'm not going to get in again to the um, get into this. We just went through those definitions. Okay. Let's stick, let's move over to time value of money. Time value of money is the basic notion that a dollar received today is worth more than a dollar received at some future date. Two forms of time value money calculation are commonly used in finance for the valuation purposes. The value of a lump sum is a lump sum payment in a single cash payment received at the beginning or end of some investment horizon. Again, if think of the lottery right when if if i win the lottery i'm going to say when i win the lottery say uh, uh 500 million dollars is the the total amount i can win i want all that money at one time am i getting all of that money it's 500 million dollars i want 500 million are they going to give me $500 million? What do you think? Are you going to give me all that money? No, they're not. They've got to, that money, they got to take not only your taxes out of that, but they got to look at the current market of where that money's come from and that availability of that and take into effect, effect the risks, et cetera, that are involved with that money they gave you. If you do an annuity, you're gonna get that 500 million, but each year they have a chance. They want you to take an annuity because they can earn money on, on that as a, as a lottery, right? So that's why they kind of take money out on the front end because they're paying you just one lump sum. Okay. And I'm not going to get into these calculations. Okay. Let's do this real quick, if you guys don't mind. Give me just a second here. We're going to get ready and move over to chapter three. Does anybody have any questions about what we covered there with chapter two? What is something maybe you didn't understand? Is there anything that I need to clarify for you. No? Clear, thank you. Okay, cool. Okay. All right, give me just a second. Let me bring up chapter three. All right. We're continuing with interest rates various interest rate measures. So this chapter, we're going to be continuing with that. Okay, excuse me one second. All right. So let's talk about, we're continuing. The interest rate, the term interest rates can have very many, can have many different meanings depending on the time frame used for analysis and the type of security that we are analyzing. Okay. We're going to be talking about coupon rates, which are interest rates on a bond instrument that are used to calculate the annual cash flow that the bond issuer promises to pay the holder. Okay. So, again, if I was the buyer or you were the buyer, 
this coupon rate is the amount that we are expected to get from that bond issuer. Okay. Required rate of return. The interest rate an investor should receive on a security given its risk and its required rate of return is used to calculate the fair present value on that security. Okay, on that loan. Expected rate of return. Interest rate an investor expects to receive on a security if he or she buys the security at its current market price, receives all expected payments, and sells the security at the end of his or her investment horizon. Okay, so that would be me. I'm lending you the money. My expected rate of return is that interest that I expect to receive, okay, if I buy that security basically, or I'm selling it at the current market price. I'm giving it, okay? I'm expecting to get all payments. And then at the end, I could sell that security myself, okay? At the end of that investment. I can use a car as an example. Again, I borrowed money on a car. I've paid all the interest on that car. At the end, uh, the bank got their money plus interest. That is now mine. And now I have that security on my end now that I can do with what I want. Realized rate of return is the actual interest rate earned on an investment in a financial security. So the realized rate of return is a historical measure. So that's a, it's an old measure that uh, we used. So let's talk about a little bit more about the required rate of return. So that required rate of return we just went through, again, the interest rate that's used to find the fair and present value of a financial security, okay? So example, if a bond is issued with a face value of $1,000 and it pays a $25 coupon semi-annually, and it has a coupon rate of 5%, okay? If that bond has no interest rate and it's a zero coupon bond, it will sell at a substantial discount to its face value. So what is a zero coupon bond? A zero coupon bond, also known as an accrual bond, is a debt security that does not pay interest, but instead trades at a deep, discount, rendering a profit at maturity when the bond is redeemed for its full face value. Um, essentially, okay, if you borrow this bond or you give this bond, your payout at maturity is going to be more. The required rate of return, well, I've already talked about that, so I'm not going to go back into that anymore. What's the expected rate of return? Our expected rate of return on the financial security is the interest rate a market participant expects to earn by buying the security at its current market price. So again, if I'm buying that security at the current price and I receive all projected cash flow payments on that security and I'm selling that security. We are, again, we already kind of talked about that. I'm not going to go in again to these calculations um, at this point because that's a lot of algebraic equations and such and I want to get the main concepts through to you guys. So what's the role of efficient markets? An efficient market is the speed in which a financial yeah, financial security price prices adjust to unexpected news to maintain equality with their fair present value as a security. And that's referred to as a market efficiency. Again, 
we have adjusted the price based on unexpected news, right? So we'll talk about inflation again. We'll talk about a recession again. Um, so to maintain a fair present value, we have to make adjustments, okay? So if the financial market is sufficient, which tends to be the case most of the time, the current market price of that security tends to be equal to its fair price present value. When there's an event that occurs that unexpectedly changes interest rates or characteristic of the financial security, the current market price of the security can temporarily diverge from its fair present value. Again, the securities change based upon the current interest rates of the market. What's my realized rate of return? We discussed that a second ago. Okay. The realized rate of return on a financial security is the interest rate actually earned on an investment in a financial security. Again, an example, post measure the interest rate on the security. Okay. This kind of goes back to something we talked about a little bit ago, Amon. Um, when we talked about the fact of um, would I charge more? because of making sure that I'm gonna get a rate of return on that investment, okay? Um, and whether I wanna give that or not, okay? That's something that, that we're looking at there. Now, let's talk about bond, eva bond valuation. What is a bond valuation? This employs the time value of money concept. So fair value of a bond, reflects the present value of all cash flow promised or projected to pre be perceived on that bond discounted at the required rate of return. So we're expecting that bond that we're issuing to have the same rate of return at the time that it is issued. Okay. Now, what is the bond valuation formula used to calculate fair and present values? Coupon bonds, they pay the interest rate based on a stated rate and the interest payments per year, okay? So again, the payments you or I get on that bond are gonna be calculated, okay? And are gonna be generally consistent over the life of that bond. So if each year I'm expected to get $100 in interest on that bond, I won't see a fluctuation in that occur in general terms. Now, a zero coupon bond, they do not pay coupon interest. The interest is zero, okay? So there's no interest being paid on those bonds that we borrow as a company. The face or par value of the bond is a lump sum payment received by the bondholder at maturity. So rather than me receiving interest on a uh, annual payment, that money is going to be paid to me in a lump sum. OK, at the end of that period of time that I invested that, even it's like a CD as well. OK. So now when the new bonds are issued, the coupon rate of the new bond is typically set at the current required rate of return. So that's saying that at the end of that, the rate of return that it was signed at is what I should receive. So what is a premium bond? A premium bond is a bond that is trading above its face value. Or in other words, it costs more than the face amount on the bond. A bond might trade at a premium because its interest rate is higher than the current rates in 
the market. A discount bond, on the other hand, is a bond that is issued for less than its par or face value. And discount bonds may also be a bond currently trading for less than its face value in the secondary market. This bond is considered a deep discount bond if it's sold at a significantly lower price than par value. Okay. And then a par bond is a bond that sells at its expected face value. This typically means that a bond sells for $1,000 since it's the face value of most bonds. And a par bond will have a yield to the investor that might match the coupon amount attached to the bond. Now, this is all a lot of information I'm throwing your way. And I do uh, want to make sure you guys are kind of understanding what's the difference between these bonds. Does anybody have questions on these type of bonds? And which bond would would you want to, if you were the company, which bond would you want to have uh, available, or not a company but a bank, would you want to have available for your individual um, customers? Which one would be the best value for you? Anyone? Okay. So let's talk about equity valuation then. The equity value of a company is not the same as its book value, okay? It's calculated by multiplying a company's share price by its number of shares outstanding, whereas the book value of a share or shareholder's equity is simply the difference between a company's assets and liabilities. So again, let's talk about that. The equity value of a company is not the same as its book value, okay? So we're trying to look at calculating and multiplying a company's share price by its number of shares outstanding, meaning what's the value of that company based upon the shares, their current prices, and what shares are outstanding, what is out there in the current shares. Whereas their book value or shareholders equity is simply the difference between the company's assets and liabilities, okay? Now, for me, my company, my website, I have no shares. I have nobody that's involved. There's no equity valuation to look at. So because it's just me, I'm looking, we're, we're talking about my value being my assets and liabilities, what I have coming in, what I have going out, what do I own, what do I not? When we have shareholders, now we're taking into consideration, what's the value of that stock, the price of that stock, and how many of those shares are out there? Okay, now, what are we looking at here? In finance, the valuation, it's the process of determining the value of that asset. And so therefore, the equity valuation is us referring to or determining that fair market value. Well, what's the importance of this? Why do we care about equity valuation? Okay. The whole idea of the stock market is based on this. Okay. Stock markets have a wide variety of stocks to offer, which have perceived market value that changes every minute because of the change in information that the market is receiving on a real time basis. Are any of you guys into investing into the stock market? Do any of you invest? 
No, it is very big risk. Exactly. It is a very big risk, right? And we talked about that neuron last week when we talked about that is why a lot of companies that have employees, we as the employees, we don't pay attention to that, but there's somebody on that back end that's taking care of our our uh, retirement and potential future earnings, our 401k. Where do you think that they're they're getting that money for our future retirement? They're investing our money for us. We're not the ones paying attention to it. Okay. Give you an example of uh, a group that individuals thought their money would always be there when they retired. We're going to use, I'm going to use uh, General Motors, big automotive manufacturer. I had an uncle that was there for over 30 years. Man, those guys, they used to retire and they could live high on the hog. It's a, it's a, sorry, that's a terminology. They could live well and have a good retirement waiting on them. I keep going back to that financial crisis. There were many of those individuals that were being bought out, asked to retire early, being given pennies on the dollar for early retirement. Those who stayed, i.e. one of my relatives thought, nah, I'm staying. I'm going to be fine. I got, I've got two to three more years left, and I've got a great retirement waiting on me. Well, guess what? The interest rates that their money and the value and all of that that's in that stock and all of that went down. Those earnings weren't happening. Stock was being sold and off, and those individuals lost that money that had been being put in there for years. They So where I'm going with that is they'd have been smarter to take that buyout because the individuals at GM knew that eventually those pensions, those benefits were going to be hit because all that money is in a stock market. All that money's in somebody else's hands for the up and down trading that goes on. Okay. Up, oh, wrong slide. My apologies. Okay. So what is the importance of equity valuation for an individual? On a micro level, the valuation is beneficial for the entire it's beneficial for the entire stock market ecosystem. However, it does does it benefit an individual to study and apply the principles of equity evaluation? Well, markets receive information every moment and making an attempt to the factor, the financial effect of this information's stock price. Individual F estimates of the effect vary, and as such, different people may come up with different stock prices. Therefore, there can be a difference between the market value of a company and what an investor calls its true value or its intrinsic value. So where I'm going with that is um, the valuations may have a company's value over here, but that company may have uh, its own belief of its intrinsic value, which can fluctuate the day on that stock market. So investors stand to gain a lot of money if they are able to correctly identify that difference. The second richest person in the world, Warren Buffett, made his fortune correcting and applying the art of equity evaluation. In fact, the theory of equity valuation has been heavily influenced by the works of Warren Buffett and his mentor. So again, he didn't trust what the company said their intrinsic value was in doing an about and in doing the evaluation, I keep wanting to say evaluation, you have to excuse me, educator terminology there. He determined where he should be buying and selling and where his money should be going as far as companies go. Okay. And of course, again, you can utilize an equation like this to help you um, with determining the equity valuation. 
So the present value methodology, it applies to time, value of money to evaluate a stock's cash flows over its life. And again, what are you trying to do? You're trying to forecast that that particular stock, while it may go up or down, there's going to be, what are the ebbs and flows? Can you trust that when you, when that reaches the maturity you want it to be, is it going to be at the value you want? Are you going to make money by staying in it? So this is where kind of you're forecasting, right? And that's what this value valuation is doing. You're able to calculate, okay? Now, with the zero growth, you're assuming that the dividend always is going to stay the same. There's no growth. Therefore, stock price would be equal to the annual dividend divided by the required rate of return. So you're saying that uh, there's, there's no change, right? Zero growth. So you're expecting it to be exactly like this. Whee! No change. Do you like that sound? Whee! Okay. So the question becomes this. If it's a zero growth, think about this. Is it going to be safe to invest in that type of stock? Here's what I mean by that. Are you going to worry that there is ever going to be kind of a major fluctuation in the value of that stock? What are your thoughts? Anybody? What do you think? Would you be would you be comfortable putting money in that stock as an individual, as a company? Anybody? When you are saying fluctuation, yes. uh, it means going up and down. Correct. Or just going up. Both. Up and down, right? Yeah, because think about it, Ahmed. When we're talking about stock, when you're investing in that, are you investing for short term for the short term or the long term? Well, if I'm looking for a quick gain, I will go for the short term. Okay. But if I'm looking for a big gain, right. uh, I think I will go for the long term then. Okay, right. So most people, when they put into the stock market, most, I'm not saying all, they're in it for the long term, right? If yes. I've got if I've got a stock that I want to buy that is not going to have a large rate of return, but it's going to be consistent, would I want to put money into that or would I rather put money into that one where I've got to worry about it no, going up and down? I'll go for the consistent, of course. Right. Right. So this is all for the state. Right. So this is what's interesting about the reason I ask you that question. When I was speaking with a financial advisor at the, the last university I worked with on a full time basis and we had money going in. Most of those companies, what they will do is their team is going to look at these valuation equity, equity valuation, these calculations, and they're the ones that are looking every day and saying, okay, for my client, i.e. me, to have money going towards a retirement, I want to have a, um, what we would call a diverse portfolio, right? I want to have dividends that are zero growth, constant growth, uh, what we would call super normal, okay? I want to make sure that I've got several different types of companies on that stock market that I'm investing in. Those that have seen, you know, on average that zero growth, so they're steady, so we know there's going to be a steady maybe growth in, in what they're going to get. 
uh, the constant growth or and also those that are high risk which may not grow okay the non-constant all right so they're going to look at all of them for you and where to put that money for you and that's why a lot of people will not be come investors. Now we've seen a trend over the last few years of people becoming what we call day traders, where they're paying attention to it. They have gotten into the stock market a little more and they're doing it on their own. Well, each time they're doing that, they're having to take, even though they might not, might not be cal using this calculation, they are doing their own type of calculation to kind of determine uh, which stocks they should be buying or selling, right? Now, that's a dangerous part of the stock market too, though, is if somebody doesn't know about the stock market, if they don't understand these calculations or putting money in, they're risking losing a lot because they might see something. I've got a friend of mine that's in crypto, which at some point we're going to talk about fintech, that says, I want all of my money. I want, to, I want it low. I want it low I want it low because I want to buy. But if he's not looking at evaluating those companies he wants to buy because it's low, well, he could be setting himself up for failure. He could end up losing his behind. So you have to take all of this into consideration. And that's what the companies have to look at. But that's also what you would have to look at if you were the one that's, that's in the stock market. And we're going to get back to the interest rates and how that impacts things. So. Firms will, in a super normal or non-constant growth, firms are often going to experience periods of uh, super normal or non-constant dividend growth, after which the growth settles at some constant rate. Okay, so what they're saying here is there's going to be some inconsistencies, but eventually there's a belief that it's going to level out. Okay. Now, what is the impact of interest rates on those security values and, and the values altogether here? So as the interest rates increase, the present value of those bonds, those stocks start to decrease, right? It goes back to, again, what did we talk about last chapter? Talking about the value of how those rates impact our spending. So that means those companies are watching their revenue, they're watching their, their line. And if those interest rates are now in, increasing, up, oh, my profit's starting to go down, the value of my bonds are going to decrease. So we're going to start seeing bond prices, stock prices start to go down. It's all fluctuated, right? Okay. And again, there's a greater risk. Now, what's the impact of maturity on the security values? A bond's price sensitivity is measured by the percentage change in its present value for a given change in interest rates. Okay. Again, there's sensitivity that's involved. The shorter the time that remaining to the maturity, the closer a bond's price is going to be to its face value. The further a bond mature is from maturity, the more sensitive the price, right? So again, we're talking about a bond. We could use stocks in the same way that there's a chance that that bond's value, let's say this is the midpoint, okay? Here's the bond. Here's the bond. Here's maturity, okay? If we're getting closer to that maturity, the closer the bond's price is going to be to its value, okay? The value is there. But based on interest rates, the further we are away from that maturity, the more chance that there's interest rate changes affecting the level of that bond. And then the relationship between those bond prices and sensitivity and maturity, are, they're not linear. OK, and what I mean by that is this. OK, 
So as time remaining to the maturity on this bond is increasing, right? Okay, let's, let's look at it this way. I'm gonna try to do that. You guys see that, I know this is a weird, what I'm using as an example, okay? But let's say we're at the middle. Here's this bond, right? We know that it's very sensitive on this interest rate, right? Okay, as we get to maturity right here, follow my finger here, okay? There is a sensitivity that can still occur, right? So it's an arc, but it's going to decrease. It's still there, but it's decreasing. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Now let's talk about the impact of the coupon rates. So a higher coupon rate will result in lower bond price sensitivity to interest rate changes and Ceritus Perubus, okay? Again, that means that the higher the bond's coupon rate, the higher its present value at any given interest rate, okay? So the higher the amount of money on that bond, if it's a $1,000 bond compared to a $50 bond, its value is going to be higher regardless of that interest rate, okay? So the higher the bond's coupon rate, the smaller the price changes on the bond for a given change, okay? What's a duration? Duration is the weighted average time to maturity on the investment. It's time, right? Bond duration is a way of measuring how much bond prices are likely to change if and when interest rates move. So we're trying to measure not only the price, but how is that interest rate going to impact that? So understanding our bond duration can help investors, you or me, or the person working on our behalf, determine how those bonds fit into the broader investment portfolio, i.e. going back to the valuation we were talking about a little bit ago. Okay? So thinking of duration as a weighted average life of a bond, assumes the bond's cash flow does not change over its life. It's kind of saying that we can, thinking of that overall life of this bond, our cash flow is not really going to change. All right. Now, I'm going to not get into the, this is the general formula that you would want to use for a fixed in income security okay fixed income bond this is for duration continued okay so we are looking at that most bonds pay an interest semi-annually rather than annually and there's a different duration equation right okay What's the duration of a zero coupon bond? And this was just a continuation of uh, the duration example. The duration of a zero coupon is the current price that an investor is willing to pay for a zero coupon bond, assuming that the semi-annual compounding of interest is equal to the present value of the single fixed payment that the bond is going to receive on maturity, the amount that's gonna be received, okay? So what are the features of it? The duration and coupon interest. The higher the coupon or promised interest rate payment on the bond, the shorter its duration. Remember length of time we talked about with the, the car loan earlier. The larger the coupon or promised interest payment, 
the more quickly investors receive the cash flow on a bond and the higher is the present value and the weights of those cash flows in duration. And duration and rate of return is duration decreases as the rate of return on the bond is increasing. Okay. Duration of maturity means the duration increases with maturity, but at a decreasing rate. Again, we covered that earlier. So what's the economic meaning of duration? Okay. In addition to being a measure of the average life of a bond, duration is also a direct measure of its price sensitivity to changes in interest rates or the elasticity. Okay. It's the elasticity of the bond. For small changes, bonds will move inversely and proportional in manner based on the size of the duration, okay? When large interest rate changes and duration occur, duration accurately is measuring the price of sensitivity on the financial securities only for those small changes in interest rates. So a basis point is the equal uh, to the one hundredth of one percent. So that's just a basis point. All right. I would really suggest this particular chapter, as you guys probably saw with me, this is probably one of those chapters that is not my area of expertise, which is why I'm relying on the chapter uh, to kind of give that information to you. Now, this next chapter we're going to go through comes into the regulatory and such, which is a little more my area of it. But I would really, because there is an assignment, a discussion assignment this upcoming week uh, for this, I would read through these notes. I'm also going to put the instructor notes to help you with better understanding this particular chapter. Okay. So I, I do apologize that bonds are not kind of in my area of expertise, but I wanted to try to convey it all in a way that's easily understandable for you, okay? Now, we have a half hour left. Does anybody have any questions on that particular chapter? I, again, that was a dry chapter in some respects for me uh, to come, come cover with you, excuse me. But I'm happy to try to, to go over that or we can do that again outside of here. I'm happy to cover that for you. Any questions? Okay. I do need to take just a two second break, get another drink. I'll be right back, guys. And then we'll get started on chapter four. Okay. I'll be right back. <clears throat> Okay, thank you guys. I appreciate you giving me a second there so we could go back. Um, let's break this up real quick, guys, because I went through a lot of information with you guys. Did anybody have an exciting weekend? Did you do anything exciting? Let's break it up a little bit because credit management money can be uh, a little dry. Anybody? Oh no, you guys don't want to talk? Nothing interesting. No? Oh man. You know what I did? I actually got to put up my uh, Halloween decoration since it's Halloween in, uh, at the end of the month here in the US. So my daughter and I, I'll say my daughter and I, it was pretty much this guy right here, uh, put up our, our decorations. And so I did that. 
I didn't get to go play golf. I wanted to, but I didn't get to go play. I, uh, which is unfortunate. I need to, but I did spend money on a new putter the other day. Now we're talking about interest rates and investments. I don't know if that was a good investment on my part. We'll see. Uh, you know, but it's all goes back to the user when it comes to that. Right. Uh, so yeah. Neuron, did you do anything exciting this weekend? Um, actually the weekend is more to be for family stuff and, uh, for some work and some studying. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> nothing special. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I understand you there too, Neuron, because I, uh, again, uh, with the different projects I'm working on, it was, you, you feel like there's, there's always some type of work to do. So I completely understand it. Um. Saif, how about you? Did you do anything exciting? Uh, again, for me, not much. Uh, it is Thanksgiving, so we do have a lot of time off from school and work and stuff like that. So I did meet up yeah. with some of my friends and we went oh, to the with my family. I love it. That is that is awesome. I love yeah. it. Cool. All right. Well, let's do this. Does anybody else want to share? Did you guys do anything? Anybody? Man, nobody did anything exciting. It sounds like my my uh, days. Um, OK, so let's do this. Let's get into chapter four. You want to come say hi? Look, she wants to come say hi, guys. Sorry. It's that time. She's like, come on, dad. All right. So let's talk about the Federal Reserve System monetary policy and interest rates okay so what are the major duties and responsibilities of the fed so there are central banks who determine implement and control the monetary policy of their countries okay think about who are your uh central banks and we'll talk about that in a minute we have the federal reserve or the fed it, which is the central bank of the United States. And that was formed back in uh, under the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. And it's an independent central bank. Now, what are the duties of, of the bank? Conducting monetary policy, supervising and regulating depository institutions, maintaining the stability of our financial system, and providing payments and other financial services to our US government, the public, the financial institutions, and foreign official institutions. Okay. So the Fed has their hands in pretty much everything that happens when it comes to our financial system in the US. What's the structure? We have 12 Federal Reserve banks in the US. Each of them are a depository. Okay, so there's money in each. And they operate under the general supervision of the Board of Governors. So there's a board that oversees the 12 Federal Reserve Banks. Each of those boards is made up of nine members. Nationally chartered banks are required to become members of the FRS system, the Federal Reserve System. Again, nationally chartered banks are required. Okay. Now, who do you think make up those board of directors, those nine members in those 12 different Federal Reserve banks? Who do you think are some of those individuals that, that are part of those board of directors? Anybody? You're not right or wrong on this one. Do you think it's going to be somebody like you or me? No? Uh, I think someone expert in uh, finance, so maybe uh, accountants. I would say there's going to be some accountants, but I would also say the Board of Governors are also going to be made up of those individuals that um, are probably some of the wealthiest in the U.S., right, um, that know how to make money and can provide guidance on for the federal 
uh, on what needs to be made. But you're exactly right. There's going to be definitely those individuals. So we have a seven member board of governors in D.C. Each member is appointed by the president and they must be confirmed by the Senate. OK, now, interestingly enough, they are. Uh, required to do a 14 year term, but it's non renewable. So in the U.S., one of our issues we have in the in the government is what, what we would consider lifers, people that that's all they've ever done is served in the Senate and Congress. And this particular group are not, a, not able to do that. OK, so one 14 year term. That's it. What is their primary responsibility? It's the formulation and conduct of our policies and the supervision and regulations of banks. So these are the individuals that uh, are overseeing that information and making policy, pretty much. Now, one thing that you were just saying, six of them are elected by member banks in the district. And of these six, three are actually non-bank business people which that's something that was surprising to me as I learned about this several years ago, okay? So where are these districts? So the districts are, um, as you can see, in Buffalo, Cincinnati and Pittsburgh, Baltimore, Charlotte. So as you can see, they almost have one, two, three, four. So several regions that they are over, they oversee. So it's not just one individual state except for uh dallas or, or texas excuse me texas in itself is goes a little bit into mississippi and into what is that new mexico but yeah that, that makes up the most of it there okay now the federal open market committee is the major monetary policy making mon ugh, body of the federal reserve system they meet four times a year in Washington, but they meet more often than that, even though they're required to meet four times a year. Their main responsibility is that they formulate the policies to promote employment, economic growth, price stability, and sustainable pattern of international trade. So imagine that. They're creating the policies that help us determine our economic growth. So right now they're very busy with inflation where it is, trying to create some type of stability for us right now. Again, we're seeing such an increase in price when it comes to goods that it's very hard. So they've got to determine and help us how to sustain this. They create a set of guidelines regarding open market operations, which is the purchase and sale of U.S. government and federal agency securities as their main policy tool to achieve our monetary targets, meaning um, they are the ones that are going to kind of oversee the ability for us to purchase and sell our securities. There's the Beige Book, which is a summary of information on current economic conditions. Now, functions performed by the reserve banks. They provide assistance for us to conduct monetary policy. They change the discount rates that we were talking about a little earlier. Okay. They will regulate the loans that are transacted through each of the banks using the discount window. They supervise and regulate uh, authority over the activities of state chartered member banks and the banks holding companies, the bank holding companies, excuse me, located in the districts. So again, not only are they, they're, they're overseeing all the banks that were within those regions I showed you moments ago, okay? And is their responsibility to create the authority over them, okay? Consumer Protection and Community Affairs. They possess the authority to implement federal laws that are intended to protect consumers in credit and other financial transactions. 
So what we go through, the interest rates, et cetera, we've talked about today, they're controlling all of that. And they serve as the commercial bank for the U.S. Treasury. Now, this is an opinion-based question. What are your thoughts of having one, I'm going to say one group, this, this 12 group of banks? Do you think it's a good thing or bad thing to have those banks overseeing uh, the other banks, et cetera, and also overseeing the federal government money? What are your thoughts on that? Do you feel like it's still, is it not enough as far as uh, banks are involved and, and leadership? Or do you, how am I, I'm trying to phrase this question in a way that it could be answered. And where I'm going with that is, is there too much control by little number of banks, or do you feel that it is adequate number of banks to serve the overarching for not only the country, but the government itself? What do you think? Would it be better to have a larger system or smaller system to oversee? Anyone? Okay. So let's talk about what else they're doing. They issue new currency, okay? Paper and coin. Now, there's a concern in the US that because we are in a deficit and we've been in a deficit for years, that the solution of the banks has been to just print new money. So, again, the idea of money is the idea of money is okay, I'm going to take and I'm going to print new money to put back into the, the system, into what we're spending regularly. So, we're going to create new money to put out there. Well, what does that do with the money that's out there? Does it strengthen the value of that dollar? Does it decrease the value? What do you think? So when it comes to the value, when they put new money in, what is that doing to the value of the existing money that's out there? Is it worth as much? What are your thoughts? Yes, sir. Say. No, it decreases it a lot because uh the more something is out there the less it, the more common it is the less it's worth correct it's now have you have you seen that in your country at all oh yeah oh yeah, yeah, yeah. in canada right now the canadian dollar value is just tanking it's not mm -hmm. good exactly so so realistically it does it only goes so far by putting new money into the market um so very cool they work with check clearing so uh they operate as a central check clearing system for our u.s banks routing our interbank checks to uh the divisional banks on which they are written transferring the funds from one money bank to another remember i shared on thursday where um you know again let's say me i go put a million dollars in my bank i wish if I was to put a million dollars in my bank, does that money stay there? No. That bank is being distributed in and out, right? Can they get me that money because it's mine? If I said, I'm going to open this bank account today and then I go in next week, let's just say, or let's say two months from now. If I take my money and I say, I want my money back. Are they going to be able to give me a check right then and there for my money that I've got into that bank? Anybody? What are your thoughts? We talked about this last week a little bit. They should be. They should be. But realistically, that money is not housed there because it all is, is going 
into these, this system. So think of it as, okay, here's my bank. Here's those banks that, that oversee this bank here. That money out of my bank is going into this system, which is then being distributed to another system and so forth and so on. So what you're going to find would happen, Ahmed, yes, you're going to get your money back, but they're not in many cases going to be able to give it to you in that type of sum right away. Yeah, your money. Exactly. I, I faced a situation like this in, uh, in Egypt. Okay. I wanted to withdraw uh, an amount, uh, but they told me that you have first to put the request on a day so they can prepare the money to be collected in the following day. Mm -hmm. Pretty crazy, isn't it? So I'm, I'm yeah, <laughs> because but now it makes sense. It's in the system. Yes, that's exactly where it is. It all goes into it's not, a system. It's not on hand. No, no, and that's why I shared that example last week about the that savings and loan in the movie that I talked about because their money had to go into guess what they were a savings and loan well okay they could they they can't keep their money in the safe because they own the bank or the bank right they owe money so their money goes into the bank which the bank goes into here and and again it's all cyclical so we've got a group that controls all these policies that that come into this OK, now wire transfer services. Wire transfers are all linked to these member banks through the Federal Reserve communication system. So. When I'm working with my. Colleague in Singapore for the students in India that I'm going to be helping with their J1 visas, the money I'm exchanging with my colleague from Singapore is coming into my business account via wire transfer. That's all linked into this Federal Reserve System. They know where my money's coming in and out, okay? So it's all linked together. They handle research services. They use professional economics to conduct research. Again, we were just talking about bonds a minute ago. We were talking about valuation. They've got individuals, economists that are conducting research not only on the stocks the bonds the interest rates looking at the overall economy and where things are going again predicting futures right so they're not only looking at the now they're predicting futures based upon that valuation we were talking about a little bit ago okay so what is the balance sheet of the federal reserve They've got their liabilities, which are uh, currency that's in circulation and it's in the reserves, which is the sum of which is referred to as Fed's monetary base or the money base. So that money, their liability is that money that's in that circulation with all those other banks, et cetera. Come here, get your buddy over here. Um, now, the total reserves can be classified into two categories. Required reserves, which are the funds that the feds require the banks to hold by law. The excessive reserves, which are the additional over and above required reserves. So again, Ahmed, we were just talking about that. The banks are required to have certain amounts of money in-house, right? So for you and I, if we needed to go take our you know, $200, $300 out one day. Okay, we're cool. We're okay to do that. Okay. Um, because they have to keep that in. And if that bank is good, a bigger bank, let's say PNC, which is who I bank with, it's just a, uh, a, a national brand or a brand here in the US. I think they're a global brand, actually. Um, they can keep certain amounts above and beyond. Now let's talk about the assets. Assets are the treasury and governmental agency, i.e. Uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac securities, treasury currency and gold, 
and the foreign exchange. So believe me, you were, Ahmed, you were talking about gold, people putting money into gold. Guess what? They do it as well, right? That's some of their assets. Also, interbank loans are a small portion of their total assets, but they plan and they play an important role in implementing the monetary policy, some of those interbank loans. This is just an example of their assets and liabilities, okay? Um, and it just goes through 2007, 8, 10, 13, 16, and 18. So it's an example. So what are some of their tools? They use the following to implement policy when it comes to money. The open markets that we talked about, the discount rates, and the reserve requirements. Okay. There's a major link by which the monetary and poli uh, monetary policies impact the macro economy that occurs through the Federal Reserve, and that influence influences the market for bank reserves. Okay, we're talking micro economy or macro economy. Okay. The Federal Reserve's monetary policy also seeks to influence either the demand for or supply of excessive reserves at depository institution and in turn the money supply and the level of the interest rates. Okay. So they're saying that in your bank, this is the depository amount that needs to be there. What reserves can be there? And by the way, this is the money supply, and this is the interest rate that you're going to charge. This is what we're controlling. These are the interest rates. Okay. And this here is just the flow. This kind of lets you kind of see how it all works. Monetary policy tools continue. So depository institutions, they will trade the excessive reserves held at their local reserve banks between themselves. So again, you've got the 12 banks. So if I'm in that Texas region, that includes that small part of New Mexico and Mississippi, my money is circulating in between that area and that area only, okay? Now the rate of interest on these interbank transactions is a benchmark interest rate called the Fed fund rates, okay? That's the interest rate within that region. The Financial Services Regulatory Relief Act of 2006 authorizes the Federal Reserve to pay interest on those reserve balances, okay? So again, the government's looking to make money on money. So they're going to charge an interest rate on those balances, okay? And the Federal Reserve can take one of two basic approaches to affect the market for the bank's excessive reserves. The quantity of the reserves that are in the market and the interest rate on those reserves. So again, they can oversee the amount of the reserves that are in that particular market or they can look at the interest rate in those reserve on those reserves. So let's talk about our open market operations. When targeted monetary aggregates or interest rate levels is determined by the FMOC, it's forwarded to the Federal Reserve Board in New York through a statement, which is a policy derivative. The managers of those trading desks use those policies to instruct traders on a daily amount of open market purchases or sales to transact. Okay. Why do you think all of that goes through New York? Tell me why. Simple answer. Why is that money going through New York? Anybody? Stock market. They need to know for that trading, right? So the, the traders know 
what the amount of open market purchases or sales that can be transacted on the overall end. Open market operations are the primary determinant of changes in bank excess reserves in the banking system, which directly impacts the size of the money, the money supply, excuse me, and the level of interest rates. Okay, the Fed fund rates. Again, open market operations are the primary determiner of changes in the bank excess reserves. Okay, and open market operations are primarily conducted using the Treasury securities, but others can be used as well. Now, let's look at discount rate. The discount rate is the rate of interest Federal Reserve banks charge on loans to financial institutions in their district. Okay, they're looking to make money too. Raising the discount rate signals a desire to see a tightening of monetary conditions and higher interest rates in general. Lowering the discount rates signals a desire to see more expansionary monetary conditions at lower interest rates in general. Okay. And then the Federal Reserve has rarely used the discount rate as a monetary policy tool for the following reasons. One, it's difficult for them to predict changes in bank discount window, the, the window of opportunity, and when borrowing when the discount rate changes. Plus, it's signal, it's a signaling of importance that a discount race change often has great effects on those financial markets. Again, they're trying not to do it because they don't want to cause an impact on the market. Now, historically, the discount window lending was limited to uh, depository institutions with severe liquidity needs. So for example, the Feds made a change to the discount window lending that increased the cost of borrowing, but eased its terms in January of 2003. There were three lending programs now offered through the Fed's discount window. Primary credit, which it's available to the generally sound depository institutions on a very short-term basis, typically overnight, at a rate above the federal market, target rate, secondary credit, which is available to meet backup liquidity, which needs liquidity needs, excuse me, when it's used consistently in a timely return to a resilient market and seasonal credit when depository institutions can demonstrate a clear pattern of recurring intra-yearly swings in funding needs, okay? Now, I'm going to go ahead and stop there. We have five minutes left for the day. We were almost through this, uh, these, these slides or this information. Um, let's talk about this, this upcoming week. Um, we have, of course, again, I know we started the class with the written assignment coming up. Okay. Uh, Ahmed, please reach out to me on that because I know you had some questions there. Anybody that has questions yeah, well, on, what's that? Definitely, I will. Okay, that's what I want. Okay, open communication. I want to help. I want to help where I can. Um, so if you have questions on that, if you have any trouble with the true false questions, please let me know. Okay, again, my goal is to see you guys succeed in this class, so I want to help. This week's assignments coming up, I changed it up a little bit. There's a discussion post. So I would like you by Sunday to have your initial discussion done with it, at least a response to one of your peers. Okay, I've got the directions in the class. And then also a eight question multiple choice assignment. Okay, so I changed it up from true false to multiple choice. Um, but it will all be aligned with the chapter three and chapter four uh, PowerPoints that we just went through, and I will also upload instructor notes to help you as well. Okay. Does anybody have any questions before we end today's session? 
Thank you, sir. Oh, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. Uh, Ahmed, I still had a lot of, of uh, text in, in these PowerPoints, et cetera, but is that a little bit better for you this week? Is it a little bit more easily understood on what we covered? Uh, to an extent, yes. To an extent. Okay, so I need to still get better for Ahmed. I got you. I'll keep getting better for you, <laughs> sir. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hey, it's again, your success is my success. So if there's something that I need to do to continue to improve, I'm going to do that. Okay. Um, so if there are no questions, we've got, I'm showing three minutes left. I'm going to go ahead and give you those three minutes back for your day. Um, again, reach out to me privately on WhatsApp. I will post the uh, recording, especially for those who couldn't be here today. And uh, I hope you guys have a great rest of the week. Okay. And uh, take care of yourselves. Okay. Thank you so much. I really right. appreciate this. Thank you. No worries. Take care. Thank you, Thank you Professor. Have a nice day. You're welcome.